welcome friends on this second day and final day of our two day event in montreal i'm very happy to be here again with friends and yesterday they were friends old and new today they're all old friends now <laughs> in one day we have become friends friendship is the most important thing in human life i do not know anything more important than true friendship we have been separated to have an experience of friendship true friendship of course involves true love also but true friendship is where you never give up that friendship once you call somebody a friend friend forever i don't know how many human beings have had that experience of having a friend forever but those who have had the chance to be initiated by a perfect living master have that experience a perfect living master is a friend forever when i say forever i don't mean forever only in this life even beyond this life friend forever means really forever this kind of relationship that one can have with a perfect living master is very unique perfect living masters know our weaknesses they know we are governed by our minds we are being carried away all the time with our minds by thinking about things therefore they know in what predicament we are therefore they are never going to ever scold us or say don't do this don't do that there are too many people doing that already they only come to love us they only come to show compassion their compassion and love is extraordinary perfect living masters love us whether we love them or not whether we have feelings or not once they accept us as a friend their friendship remains constant their love remains constant and they love us no matter what our weakness is no matter what we do they love us if we love them they love us if we hate them they love us if we kill them that's the kind of love perfect living masters have for us i have not seen any example like that but i've seen examples that perfect living masters have that kind of love this kind of unconditional love is born out of the fact that they are living in the state of love they have reached a state of being in which there is nothing but love so they represent love in a personified form in a human form it's a very rare experience the more we associate with them the more we discover their strange permanent love for us their whole method of coming and taking us back to our true home is through love they pull us with their love our mind wants to learn things mind wants to be taught something mind says now to love you what should i do nobody does anything when one falls in love love is an experience that comes by itself therefore the mind wants to do something always mind says now what should what is my role what am i supposed to do therefore temporarily they become teachers they teach us how to meditate they teach us how to go inside our own self they teach us how to validate the statements they make they teach us all this just for the sake of the mind not for the sake of our true self or soul our soul needs no training and no teaching at all our soul only needs the pull of love to go back home and that is why these extraordinary people who we call perfect living masters they are very ordinary to look at very ordinary the way they live they live just like us they born like us they die like us they get sick like us they get go to hospital like us they eat food like us they are no no different but their awareness their consciousness is total that means at all times no matter what time of the day or night it is no matter whether we think they are sleeping or they are awake they are constantly in touch with our true home totality of consciousness this makes them totally different in terms of awareness and consciousness 
So that is why when we are in their company, we are affected by that consciousness, not by their life, not by what they do. That is why sometimes we are confused and puzzled by seeing some of them. And we say, how can they be any higher than others if they can fall sick like anybody else? If they are hungry like anybody else? If they uh, live their life just like anybody else? How can they be more advanced? They should be able to fast for 40 days without eating. They should be able to fly in the sky. They should be able to do extraordinary things. There are some people who do that also. But those people are trying to show off that we have something extraordinary. It's a game of ego. These masters don't come to show their ego at all. They do not want to say that they are different from others because they are not different in terms of human life. The awareness is different. And when they want to take us back home, it's their love that pulls us. And we can feel it inside, beyond the mind. Mind can resist. Mind creates doubt. It's a programmed doubt. The mind has been designed to create doubt. It's a good thing. Doubt is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. If the mind had no doubt, we would be so credulous, whatever anybody says, we'd believe. The mind does have a screening system, and that happens through doubt. Skepticism is part of the mental faculty of judging something is true or not. So that is why the mind doubts, the soul does not. Therefore, we have a strange experience of something pulling us, and the mind says, be careful, be sure, don't be very in a haste. It's okay. That's how it should work. And it works like that. The mind is fond of pleasure. Mind likes pleasurable things. And therefore, the mind only gets convinced that this is a correct path if it can get more pleasure in meditation than it gets outside, which takes a while. And that is why the mind fights for a while till it can have certain experiences inside which are more pleasurable than the experiences outside. The mind begins to join in the search for the truth and becomes a partner of the soul. This phase where the mind has to become a friend instead of an enemy takes a while. And that is, it happens. The mind also gets convinced if it has got pleasure, if it finds something interesting. That is why the first stage of experiences in meditation can be very, very pleasant and very nice. You can fly and go anywhere you like. People have interest. Are there, is there any alien life somewhere in the galaxies? Scientists are just guessing. They're trying to find, are there any planets like ours? In the astral plane, you can go to those places and see the different kind of alien that live there. This planet is not the only one having living beings. There's several planets having living beings. They're part of this universe. But we, just from physical means, have not been able to reach there. Astral plane, you can reach there and see and see the different laws of nature operating in those planets. Just an example. This Earth planet has been growing in its talent and population for many years, maybe a couple of billion years. It's a planet just like other planets revolving around stars. This one is also revolving around stars. This is not the newest planet. They are planets which are earlier than this. And in the astral plane, you can visit them. There is one planet way, which is way advanced of us. They have no idea about us. We have no idea about them. But one feature which I can mention to you now is that they have controlled time through a gadget. Now, we have no control over time right now. Actually, our scientists are a little concerned that if Einstein was right, that time-space is one unit and time is merely an ordinate of space, and we can move backward and forward in space, why can't we move backward and forward in time? 
it should be the same thing if it is the same thing this is one unit time space is one unit accepted by every scientist today and in space we can go forward and come back why not in time if it's just an ordinate of space they have not found the answer yet in that planet they not only have found the answer that you can move in time exactly like in space and they got a little gadget a scientific gadget by which they can go ahead just like while we are walking and we can walk ahead of somebody else they can walk faster and catch up with us in that planet you one man can say well, i am in a hurry and go to tomorrow and we are still in today and and then the others can catch up by going little faster this is so unique for a human being to see that there is things like that happening and they take it for granted they have used this for so long that they think it's a normal thing they can't imagine that in another planet this is not possible or at least not possible at this time so i'm just giving one example but there's so many things which are so different this is a very vast universe and the astral universe is even vaster so you can have such beautiful experiences explorations and so on people try to lose weight here because of ma matter it's only the matter the physical matter that is making us heavy there is no weight problem in the astral plane and then imagination become the reality in the astral plane whatever you want to be you can become and it's a remarkable experience when you have those experiences mind feels very happy he says i didn't know this is possible not only that you also realize that that is more real than this one this is not as real as that experience and when you realize that mind becomes a good partner in going further so there is just a little gap till the mind becomes a friend otherwise it's always trying to stop us because creating doubts about the very path itself about the very nature of this path so they always looking for evidence people are looking for evidence on these statements they don't go in to see the evidence anybody can see the evidence i remember in a university where i went as a student a, and i was giving a talk that is a scientific method and a scientist was sitting very cynically because he was almost putting his feet up on the next chair just to show that oh this doesn't matter and he got up and said how dare you call this meditational system a science there is no science involved in this i said what is your definition of science he said my definition is that you do it in a controlled condition and you can have a controlled experiment and controlled results verifiable over and over again we do that i said i know you work in that particular lab on the 6th floor of that building and i noticed that you keep the windows shut yes yes because we have some measurement tools there and if a breeze comes in they can be upset i said can you not imagine that the creator has given us a natural lab to work in called our head is a natural lab we do experiments exactly like you do do experimentation inside keep the windows closed these are our eyes keep these windows closed too and then you'll have a good result and verify and check with others who are having the same experience are they not verified and validated why do you feel that the experimentation should be only in what you observe outside and not what can be observed inside and i said if you carefully examine it's very scientific all the principles of science apply except you don't call it empirical science because empirical science means look outside only don't look inside so this is a scientific method and it's a science of discovery what else is there and it is not merely discovering that there is a mind working there and you can look at a brain and how it works you should see what the mind is capable of seeing what the eyes are capable of seeing which they can't see here all that can be opened up if you go scientifically into your own lab placed directly on top of your body everybody has that lab and they can go into it 
So I had to convince him about the scientific side of it. It's not that arbitrary that somebody is just getting a hallucination of one thing or the other. It is a very consistent thing that what we see, how we move from one stage to the other, is very consistent. There is this physical experience we are having now. And there's an astral experience. Astral experience is a different world. A world from where this world is being created. Everything that is here in this world has an original there. There's a copy. There's not original. There's a copy. You can find everything in this original thing there, of everything that you see here. And there is a certain area which is an overlap. It's interesting. People have uh, sometimes asked me, explain the overlap a little better. The overlap is the lower part of the astral plane and that overlaps the physical plane, which means when we meditate at first time, we are also connected with the physical world. We fly around in the physical world, like I explained. That's the overlap. The higher part of the astral plane is quite different. There you will find the original of everything, but not in the overlap. The overlap is used so that we can be existing in a similar state when we die. When we die, we don't go to the astral plane. We go to the overlap. That is why we are still conscious and still experiencing this physical world. They are disembodied spirits, those who have died, but they are still here. They don't go away anywhere. How can a person who is dead be still here? It's in a disembodied astral form, sensory form, but still moving around in the physical plane. How long? Till the age in the overlap finishes and they come back reborn. Most people are reborn pretty soon after going into a disembodied state. Some stay longer. For example, if a person dies by murder, unnatural death, murder, suicide, accident, one of these things which we would say is a premature death. There is such a thing as a premature death the sense each one of us has a notional life. The notional life is what it normally would be alive if an un unnatural accident does not happen. If something unnatural happens, it interrupts the notional life. Supposing somebody has a notional life of 85 years, at age 40, an unnatural event takes place, one of these, the person will still be in the overlap for the remaining 45 years. Because that's the notional life, to stay here. And that 45 years will be spent in following up the desires and following up what was missed out and what is still in the mind. The mind is still the same, sense perceptions are still the same. There is no body. There is no physical body. Astral body or the sensory body is still there. People say that our house is haunted, haunted by somebody dying. Now, the person who was living Somebody said, I think my grandma is still here in my house, people tell me. I say, okay, I'll go and talk to your grandma. Can you do that? I say, sometimes I can by accident. I can sometimes talk to them. I'll tell you an experience of a friend of mine in Chicago area. He was looking for a house to buy. True story. He was trying to buy a house and the realtor was showing him many houses. Then suddenly the realtor called and said, I have found a wonderful place for you. An old lady has died and she, the house is for sale. Her children don't want to come here. They have said sell the house as it is, including all its uh, contents and belongings. And there were some, actually some you know, equipment and things that like uh, some computer or something already in his case is not opened even. And the children said, sell it as it is. So the realtor said, it's a very good deal. All the furniture is there. Everything is already there. So he asked me, it's a good deal. Should I buy? I said, go ahead. It's a very rare deal. So he bought the house. After he bought the house, and he came one day from outside, and he saw there was a rocking chair. The chair was rocking by itself. He got frightened. Who's in the house? But there was nobody in the house. So he came to me, he said, looks like there is somebody in the house. I can't see. That 
being, we don't know who that being is, is able to rock the chair, physical chair, is able to open doors. He says, I don't like that being to open my bedroom door in the middle of the night. I said, don't worry, I'll come and see who's there. So I went to his house. I little bit pretended I can see all that. <laughs> and I said, this is the lady, the owner of the house here. She doesn't want to go. She's so disappointed that the children did not do what she expected. She expected children to take care of the house and come and use it. And children didn't care at all. So that's why she's coming to see. She's attached to the house. It's only her attachment that's bringing her back. You don't worry about it. She won't harm you. He had a hard time for a month or so. He said, I don't like that. I said, all right, I'll take her with me. My wife and I, we went to his house and we said, is this piece of furniture which she likes? They said, yes, there is one particular thing where I think she comes and sits here. I said, put it in my car. We brought it to our house. Our doors began to open by themselves. <laughs> and our lights came on by themselves. So they said, how can a person who is dead turn on lights? How can a person who is dead open doors? I said, the sense perceptions are there. Physical body is not there. They have to try very hard to in inter interfere with the working of the physical plane. And that is why this is happening. Ultimately, we have a, a friend uh, staying in the basement. He got worried. So we said, don't worry, we'll move that piece of furniture somewhere else. So we took that piece of furniture to Bruce, Wisconsin. There my wife has a house. Now doors open there. <laughs> and lights come on there. So these are phenomena. It's not only we have seen, I've heard from so many people. They sometimes come and ask me that you send these uh, ghosts away. I said, they were your loved ones. Why are you calling them ghosts now? <laughs> The, another friend of mine writes to me that some ghost is bothering me so much. I said, not a ghost, it's a person who loved you so very much. And you didn't love enough, that's why the person comes to you. So he said, no, the ghost attacks me. So we are loving somebody in the physical body, in disembodied state, we are afraid. We become a ghost. Now they say, we use two words for these disembodied spirits in India. We have a common name here, ghost here. But there we have, in, in Indian language, we call bhut and prat. The bhut is a disembodied spirit that is uh, roaming around. It couldn't find what it wanted to find in physical life. It is still searching for things. Prat is one who stuck to one place. Very often, it can be a murderer or a victim of a murder. And that on death can be stuck to the same place when there's a haunted houses and so on. Uh, these things happen. I remember somebody in India asked me to come to a rest house, which was a palace of a prince at one time, but they had made it into a guest house for officers to stay. I was working in the government and they said most officers don't want to go there because it's haunted. I said, what do you mean by haunted? They said there is a spirit there. I said, I love spirits. I like to go there, which I have li liked from the childhood, by the, by the way. I've always liked to play with this, uh, whatever they call disembodied spirits. They're friends. They're not going to be, they're not frightening us. They're trying to be friendly to us, but we don't like it because we can't see them. I went to that place on official business, government business, and it was a hot summer. So, you know, in India, in summer, we sometimes sleep outside in the open air. And if there are mosquitoes there, we use a net called a mosquito net. So, in that guest house, it was very hot. They didn't have any electric power there. So, so my attendant who accompanied me, he said, I'll make your bed outside and put a mosquito net, which he did. He said, I'm not going to stay here. I'll go to the village nearby. I said, are you also frightened? I, you are with me. Why are you frightened? No, no, no. Sir, you don't know this place. Nobody comes here. You just agreed to come here. You see what is happening inside. I said, nothing is happening inside. So I was sitting inside that 
big hall it was a big hall the like a living room at one time and they was doing work paper work there was no electric power so we had what they called a, a lamp with kerosene oil that is burnt in india and i had a lamp and i was working on my paper work late at night at about 11 o'clock i said i should go to sleep so i got up and i heard some sounds and all but i didn't care for them sounds like creeping sounds of the door opening or closing i didn't bother i came out and i went to my bed i picked up that um, uh, mosquito cover the net that was placed there and got into bed and when i took off my slippers and lay down the door of the house opened i said how can it open might be some breeze but there is no breeze here so i uh, got up and closed the door it was very strong door i said can't be opened by anybody i went back sat in my bed and waited to see if the door will open door did not open i lay down door opened <laughs> it would only open three four times i tried it would only open when i lay down so i said let it be open <laughs> so i slept when i slept i saw a big a ventilator was there up on the door a huge bird so big that i don't know how it just slipped out of the ventilator and i saw the bird going i said that was what the problem was some bird was trying to get out has gone up i slept soundly the morning i get up i found that there is a um, is a covered with net that ventilator there is no place to get out of it so the bird escaped through a regular net so then i realized it was not a bird it was something that taken the form of a bird and escaped after that i told everybody that the spirit that you were talking of is gone and people are using that place even now no spirits at all so i'm telling you a personal experience these disembodied spirits can take forms can manifest sometimes and some people can see uh, hallucinations which they say they saw a ghost and they just disappeared so many times people have these experiences because there is a whole world of disembodied spirits around us right in this physical plane this is the overlap and in the overlap you can also have many experiences of the astral plane and many experiences of the physical plane now i heard that in the bible they talk of jesus christ giving two fish to a large crowd of people and they sometimes they can't interpret what the two fish would be that with two fish he caught and gave to some people say 5000 people some say 50000 people did he catch two fish from the pond and they broke into pieces to give it not at all they have not understood what the fish are between the physical and astral plane there is a overlap this this universe is created in infinite size whatever the infinite size is imagine an infinite size on all four sides whatever infinity is it makes into a sphere this universe this physical universe is a sphere some people say that space has been curved into a sphere einstein said that or we just take infinite as a number and it becomes a complete sphere all the galaxies are part of it everything is part of it this sphere is overlapping with another larger sphere called the astral sphere when the two spheres overlap the area where the two overlap looks exactly like a fish if you can imagine i sometimes had to draw it on paper to explain that it, it looks exactly like a fish the astral plane and causal plane also overlap the same way in time and space that's also spherical much larger so there is a smaller sphere bigger sphere with an overlap second sphere with an overlap that's all the created world there's nothing else created both of them look like fish jesus gave knowledge of the fish knowledge of these regions knowledge of what is available inside what he called the kingdom of god with it inside he gave that knowledge 
And we think he just took two fish and uh, served to the people. But if you go in, you'll see the overlap looking like a fish. You have a capacity right now to go within, leave the body awareness. Just leaving body awareness opens up your inner awareness. When the body dies, the inner awareness becomes a disembodied spirit, becomes a living thing. It's not something new coming in. It's that you are ha having everything right here. Right now, you are carrying a physical body. Inside it, you're carrying an astral body. Inside, you're carrying the mind body. Inside, you're carrying your soul. Inside, you're carrying the totality. You're carrying God inside. You're carrying everything inside. There's nothing outside. Imagine, it's all a question of going within. And when we go within, cover by cover, we uncover, not by dying, just by dying while living, pulling our attention in. You will understand the nature of attention through meditation. That attention is what is creating all our experiences here. It's attention flowing out, creating experience from something inside. I gave the example of watching a movie. We don't look back and see that the projector is throwing a shadow out. We think it's real on the screen. What is the projector? What's the projector? Projector is our mind. And the destiny that we have created, picked up, the destiny we picked up, is playing like a film inside. And we are seeing in a multi-dimensional screen outside. That's all. When we look at a movie, we go to see the movie, we don't look to see how the movie is being created. If you were to see, you will find that nothing happening now, it was all in the film, re recorded long ago, it's just been put in the projector, and there's a light behind it. If the light goes off, no movie can be seen. Our soul is the light, our mind is the projector, our destiny put into the mind is the film, and we are seeing it through perceptions outside. This is not merely a statement I'm making, I'm saying verify it, validate it. All you need to do is go within. Go within through getting awareness of the outer covers off. Pull your attention inside and the outer covers will be no more there. You'll also see how outer covers are being created from the same source. The source is totality of consciousness individuating into souls, all happening inside. Souls, innumerable souls are coming up and they, souls are working through a mind which they put on their mind like a costume and create time and space. And then in the time and space, they create methods of perception which are divided to make reality more real through checking with one perception and another. And the perceptions are placed in another cover called a physical self, a physical body. The whole physical world is being created because you have a physical body. All this can be verified. So we are trained to believe, which is a good ploy done by the creator and the rulers of this creation. All creations are being governed and ruled by what we might say the ultimate power that creates. We worship God as the creator of this universe. Yes, there is a God who creates this universe. And you can see him. They say somebody went up and people go and sit on the side of the God. They come and see God. Yes, you can see anyone. All in the astral plane. The God we worship is in the astral plane. He's in space and time. They say he's sitting on a throne. Yes, he's sitting on a throne. You can go in and see. But what the reality is, who created that God? Somebody asked me, has anybody properly defined God? Or are we just making it up? I said, most of us are making it up because we haven't seen. We just have our own concept. And that's a very vague concept. God was present everywhere. We don't see him right here. Maybe he is right here. That he is. Many people worship with their hands folded and look up. I also looked up in the beginning whether God might be up there. We have no clear definition of God is. When 
people realize that there's a creative power sitting on a throne as a being they called him god and he is the ruler of the astral universe and the causal universe who is he or she or it we don't know that power we call god is the creative power of the known universes this universe physical universe and the universe that contains heavens that is why most religions have been saying that the best place to go is heaven heaven is a place with time and space exactly like this so that is why the god we worship is a soul that has gone with good good karma good actions for a term and holding that position is is this a wild statement no check it out if you don't check it out then we worship god without definition somebody said give a good definition i said it's in the bible best definition that i have seen is in the bible in john's gospel opening verses in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god what better do you want to know the word is god then the question is how can a word spoken word be god all things were created by that word now is it, it is a, another question now to understand what the word means i looked up a major dictionary big one i opened the dictionary to see what word with w capital means i opened it word means the bible it means a book many people believe that the word means a scripture a book how can a scripture a book that we have printed out here be the creator of the whole universe forever that's not the meaning of the word at all how come was john said that in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same words were written in an indian scripture the rig veda thousands of years earlier where it says in the beginning was a sound and the sound created the creator and the sound is created everything they they use word they use sound nod it's called nod there how can there be such similarity the similarity comes from a very simple fact and that's very interesting when you say sound or word we are thinking of a spoken word thinking of a sound that our ears can hear that's what the meaning is something that is audible these this language has been used to describe something that is audible something that is audible is the creator of god and creator of everything what could that be what is audible why has it been so stated that something that is audible can be heard is the creator of everything including god the reason is the totality of consciousness from where everything has come it is our true self our true self never disappears no matter where we are what has happened is that the true self created the experience of the many and we say there many souls the souls created the experience of time and space through the mind and the mind becomes part of our self the mind creates sense perceptions in sense perceptions we have the power to hear and when we are in physical form we have the power to listen listening is a great power what has happened is that the self which was totality of consciousness which was the primary soul the self soul which had experience of other souls the same self which took up the mind and became created the universal mind and all participated all souls participated in the universal mind having their own minds which then led to this different sense perceptions here that self continues to be listened to it can be heard not there here in the physical plane you can hear your own self is audible that's why the term word has been used by john that's why the word um, kalma has been used in islam that's why the word shabd has been used by the sikh community that is why 
the word Nada has been used in the Rig Veda. It's all saying that it's audible. Now, it is meant for human beings. This message that even God can be heard is a word. It's audible. It's meant for human beings at this level. When we meditate and draw our attention inside behind the eyes, what happens? We hear sounds. Not sound from outside. You can block your ears completely. You still hear the sounds. Some sounds are physical sounds. When your attention is very strongly, intensely concentrated, you can hear even the bloodstream going through. You can hear your heartbeat. You can hear many sounds are physical. But in the center of the sound, not on the sides, the center of the sound is sound can be heard which is coming from your own self. The same self, that's going to be the self right up to the top. Self never changes. The self is audible in the physical plane. That's why these words have been used in every religion. That's why these words have been used in every place where realized enlightened people have spoken about it. That's the real reason. That's the definition. That you want to see God, listen to God at the physical plane, go with listening to the next one, you can go to the top. Now, what we understand by listening is listening with the ears. But we can also, when we think of something, we are listening to our thoughts. You can't know what your thoughts are if you don't listen. We listen all the time. We are the greatest listeners. Everything is happening around us by listening. I'll tell you one something very interesting, which most people don't know. When we see this cup, what we are seeing is not a cup. What we're seeing is a shape with certain transparency and whatever color it is, we are seeing just a shape. What makes it a cup? When the shape comes into the head, by association of ideas of having similar things that people called it cup, we call it cup. That means every time we are seeing something, the mind speaks and says it's a cup. But we got so used to it that we don't see the steps happening. And we think it's a cup. Cup is made up in a particular language. If I were another language, it will call something else with which sounds I grew up. Language is nothing more but sound, phonetic symbols, put into a certain order just to communicate with each other in the physical world. And we grow up in different languages, different cultures, and those symbols become language for us. And we begin to associate things with, that, they, with those words. It's, it's just association of ideas that's creating meaning to words. But when we are looking at things, the sense perception has no point, no idea of what a thing is. The mind tells what a thing is. And we listen to the mind and know what is happening. If you carefully examine this statement, every experience we are having, no matter what, is all being told to us and we listen and it becomes an experience. It's very subtle. That is why listening is the main capacity that we are using. Not seeing. That doesn't make sense if you just see. You listen to the mind interpreting what it is and therefore the capacity to listen is a secret. We listen to outside. You are listening to my talk. It gives you some ideas. If you don't listen, this is spoken language at the beginning. When we go to inner language, it's a sound. Musical sound. Not a harsh sound. The sound of the self is so melodious, so beautiful. In the beginning, when you try to listen, because you're listening from a physical to the inner, it looks something like a bell sound. You see, a bell sound, so large bell sound, big bell sound. When you hear the bell sound, there's a hit of the bell, and then you hear the peal. The inner sound is mostly a peal, but it still has an up and down. It's a peal that comes from the self, not from any side, not from the body. It's coming from our conscious self. You listen to it, it will pull your attention inside faster than any amount of mantra, any amount of repetition. That is why 
the sound is very important to listen to and when the sound is when you put your attention on the sound the peel becomes longer and longer the more you are advancing towards yourself your attention is going in the peel becomes one peel long peel and it you advance it changes the sound changes you can hear it here physically you can hear it astrally with sense perceptions but when you want to hear it further up in the causal plane it becomes something that has been pre-existing forever it is not a sound that like the sound we hear here above the causal plane there is no space and time we can't call it sound there we discover first time the sound we heard was ourselves and that's why they given different names to these sounds this sound we speak has been called varanatmak shabd that means it can be spoken and can be written the inner sound is called dhunatmak shabd that means it's a sound a musical sound the next one is called anhad shabd that means it's already pre existing with no beginning no middle and end the next one and the soul is called sar shabd the real shabd is the soul the soul itself is the sound and when you go to the top it's called the sat shabd that means there's a totality totality is called also sound now you realize why god the ultimate god has been defined as word that word is what created everything people say what well, who created god the answer is there word this is not merely a, it's not a sound there is entire creative power the entire totality of consciousness has been called the word because it can be heard in the physical plane here it's, it's a remarkable way to express these things there is no real language to explain things which are beyond time and space but to explain something that occurs so high with something that can be achieved here can be seen here is the best description that they could have given and that is why this particular method of union with your own true self true yoga my master great master called it the surt shabd yoga yoga means realizing union with your totality surt means attention shabd means sound put your attention on sound you don't need any other med meditation but we can't hear the sound inside therefore we meditate with other things like repetition of words why do we repeat words some people think that the words are very magical therefore we repeat them no we repeat words with the mind so that the mind can't think of other things so we can pull our attention inside the whole game is of putting attention on your own self within that's what the whole spiritual path is so if you get to hear the sound of the self nothing else is needed no mantra is needed if you listen to the self inside it will take you back right all the way to your true home this is so powerful this sound that is why i am sharing these secrets with you so that you should know there is a shortcut also the shortcut is listen to the sound you can't hear it then create your sound by repeating words inside your head through mantras and simran and all that this kind of meditation we do is basically for the mind so the mind gets occupied and we get we we want to bypass the mind by keeping it busy okay you be busy repeat words and we'll take our travel inside there's a old story of a young boy aladdin we call him aladdin some call him aladdin or aladdin aladdin a young boy and he happened to find a lamp and he rubbed the lamp and a big genie appeared and the genie said master i am your slave give me any order you want to give so he was frightened in the beginning seeing such a big genie then he realized he is the master he can give any orders so he began to give orders build a house for me in second the house was built is now make a big bridge over the river second bridge was made when he gave many orders he was out of orders because the genie worked so fast so then he said genie do what you like so the genie began to tell him what to do so from a master he became a slave of the genie genie is telling him now go there do this so a friend of this aladdin came and said aladdin you used to be very lucky happy guy and what's happened to you now he says i don't know i got, i found a genie and i thought i am the master but the genie is now telling me because he's so fast 
I can't give him any orders what to do. He gives me orders now what to do. They said, I'll tell you a solution to that problem. Next time Jeannie says what to do, you give an order. Say, Jeannie, bring a big wooden pole from the forest. And when you bring the pole, say, dig it in the middle of this house in my, in my room. Okay, the pole has come. Now, Jeannie, go up and down this pole till I give you the next order. <laughs> a genie is under control now. So they say our mind is a genie. It is given to us, so it's, we are the masters. We are supposed to tell the mind what to think. We are supposed to tell the mind what to do. Instead of that, we are doing what the mind is telling us. Exactly the worst. So the masters come as the friend of that Aladdin and say, Look, when the mind says what to do, tell it, sit on the center of the head and keep on repeating the word till I give you the next order. So the Simran, mantra, repetition is meant for that. Keep the mind busy and you find your way up to the sound. You travel up to the sound, keep the mind busy by repetition. So the repetition, speaking words don't take you there. They cannot. Spoken words are physical words. They're spoken here. At the most, they can be spoken in the astral plane. No more. They don't go anywhere beyond. And people sometimes think that by repetition of words, just by repeating words of the highest level, we'll go there. No, you're here. The words are just saying there is a high level. It does not mean that you're going to high level by repeating <laughs> words here. Repetition has a very limited use. Therefore, Ordinary meditation has a very limited use. But if you follow yourself, which is audible, and you listen to your own self, you can go way beyond, even beyond the mind. It becomes different. It's not a sound anymore there, but we call it a sound because of our experience here. That is why it's been described as a sound. <laughs> that is this Surta Shabda Yoga, placing your attention on the sound within, I have found is the best yoga. And I'm not saying just because I heard about it, I'm saying I tried many yogas. I tried all kinds of yogas. It was, there was a reason for that. I'll tell you something personal. I got initiated by great master Baba Savan Singh in 9th of March, 1936. Most of you were not even born. In 1936, I had some idea, because my father was a follower, parents were followers, I had some idea about what these teachings are. I was still young. My grandfather took me to Great Master for half initiation. Great Master used to give young children half initiation so they could listen to the sound, practice sound. Most of them were practice, it helped later on. When they became teenagers, they went back, he would give them the method of repetition of words and a combination of the two and how to contemplate the master inside. The three phases of that initiation that he used to do. I was taken by my grandfather for initiation and I did not know that I have to be taken there. So I was not properly dressed. In fact, we were playing something, some games. And he said, come, I'm taking you for initiation. I just went. Great Master was selecting other candidates for initiation, who were all present one by one. So when he took me there, Great Master held me by the arm and asked me a question. What kind of initiation do you want? Sweet or salted? He used to ask the children. I had seen him doing this many times. And everybody would say, sweet. And he had some candy sitting next to him. He'll get a candy and say, go. So I said, he's trying the same thing on me. But I knew this is just a trick. So when he said, what kind of initiation do you want? Sweet or salty? I said, no, no, none of that. I want one inside. He laughed and just kept his hand on my arm. I thought he's not accepted me because he never said yes, never said anything. Those who were being accepted were being sent inside the hall. Those who were not accepted at that time were asked to go away. 
So I was neither told to go in nor told to go away. He was just holding my arm. And I said, let him leave me. I think I have not been picked up, so I should go. At the end of the selection process, he said, come in, you will get full initiation, not half which your grandfather has asked. So I was surprised. He made me sit in front. <clears throat> and he said something very interesting. Those words I can't forget. It, as he was initiating, the very first words he spoke was, what I am going to give you, I got from my master, Baba Jamal Singh. It has worked for me. I hope what I am giving you is the same thing I got. I hope it will work for you. If it does not, you are free to go anywhere and try something else. And then he said, if you find something better, please do me a favor. Come back and tell me, I will also take that. Great master's words. That struck me. He's so open. He's just telling his method of finding something. And he says, if you find a better method, go and take it. He's given full permission. But they, those words have struck with me that I can, I have to f find something better. I'll go and tell him. I'm willing to find it even today and take it. If I can find something better, I'll take it right now. I went home. My dad didn't know, my father didn't know that I had been initiated. So I told him what happened, that he's given me full initiation. He was very happy. So glad that two other followers of the master soon came into the house and he told them, good news, my son Ishwar has got initiated, full initiation at this age, nine and a half. And those other satsangis, followers of the master, of the same master said, we are very sorry to hear that. Yeah. I was over, overhearing this in the next room, their conversation. They said, do you realize what has happened? They told my dad. This boy at this age has just been taken and initiated. He never had a chance to understand what initiation is. He has no idea what has happened. And when he grows up, you will see he will leave this path. It's, it's just because of you that he's got initiated. He had no chance to know what it is. I was hearing all this in the next room. By the way, it looks to me I was smarter in those days than I am now. Because I was very carefully listening to this. He's, my dad said, I think it's a good, good thing that he got initiated. They said, no. Look at Nikki. There was another boy, a son of a very advanced Sathangi whose pet name was Nikki, and he became an attorney later on. Look at him. He got initiated when he was 11. As he grew up, he's completely given up the path, realizing that he was just, just taken in for a ride, and there was nothing in it. Talk to Nikki. So he said, it'll be the same case, the neighbor said. I thought to myself, what they're saying is right. I never got a chance to really know what it is. And maybe this is just one yoga he is teaching, Shurt Shabd Yoga. Maybe other yogas are better. And I am not going to commit any sin by going and looking for other yogas because he himself said, go and do it. So consistently with his orders, I will go and find something better. I have no idea how good this is or how good the others are. And the next eight years, even from that age, I spent looking for something better. I happened to find yogis, swamis, and so I tried every kind of yoga that is available in those years. And every kind of got converted to different religions. I was baptized. I got converted to Islam. I tried everything. And it is only after all that that I came to Great Master. And I said, I believe what you gave looks to me the best. Of course, even today I can tell you, because I meet yogis and swamis and different uh, people of different yogas all the time. I sometimes wonder why great master put me through that eight years of almost a rebellion to him and studying other things. Now I realize that in my works doing seva to great master, I meet those very people doing the same kind of practices and I can tell them exactly where they are going to end up. 
So this was an advantage to get me extra training in those things. But I found after trying all these systems, every system I could try, and even later on I tried, that I got back to serious meditation on Surat Shabd Yoga. So I am only saying that you can try other things. People come and say, can we try something else along with it? Yes, go ahead. Try everything. There is no restriction. This is just one method of discovering yourself. And it's a good method. It's a verified method. And I would not say this recommend to anybody. If it doesn't work for me, I'll not tell somebody else to go and try it out. So that is why it's a tried method compared with the other system of yoga, other system of discovering. People, most people I might tell you, are trying to figure out their self below the eyes. Six centers. Energy. They are centers of energy. We all have them. We all have six centers of energy. They move in circuits. You can actually see the, if you do meditation, you can see the circuitry of how the energy is spread out around the body and around the world. Our whole connection, energetic connection with this universe is through the six centers of energy. But they are centers of energy, not centers of awareness. You do not have higher awareness. You can have unusual experiences, out-of-body experiences, and people have out-of-body experiences. They still are connected with the physical body. The reality of the physical body disappears temporarily. And then suddenly you're back to tell you what happened. This still looks more real. After all those experiences, you're back to square one. Every time you have an experience through the heart center, to other centers, the kundalini, reversal of kundalini, that tried everything. It's temporary experience. You come back, oh, now I know I had that experience. What is the reality for you? Physical reality. Because they all lie below your wakeful state. This wakeful state is very important. It's only in the wakeful state that we can make certain decisions like seeking something. Not in those states, nor in the states above. This is a very interesting state we are in right now, the wakeful state when we make decisions. And seeking is part of that experience in the wakeful state. So that is why I am, when I am telling you about this method, it's not that it's just I studied one method. I'm comparing it with all the others. And you can compare also. You can compare where they take you. You can compare how people have called the astral plane their true home. They called heaven their true home. And if you study heaven, you will find it's temporary. Even heaven living in heaven is temporary. Nobody living there permanently. Just because the time spent there is long, it looks like you are there forever. Nobody there forever. The only place where you are forever is beyond the mind. Even mind has got a time, time limit. So these things I am sharing with you. What is my role? Why have I come to talk to you? It is not because I think I have something better than you. You all have the same thing I have. Nobody is different. I have come to share this thing with you as my service, as my seva to my master. I am just carrying out an, an order which is like an opportunity for me to do seva. Now what is seva? Service. Service means doing something without expecting a reward, but you get rewarded anyway. But you should not expect a reward. If you expect a reward, it's not seva. Service for anybody, service for master, service for people, is all good service. Don't expect any reward. Reward comes indirectly. When great master was alive and in the Dera where he lived, there was no electric power. So weather was very hot. So people used to fan him. And this Sevadars or those who were doing this particular Seva carried a big fan. And when he was speaking, they held the fan behind him and they waving the fan. And I, I wanted to also do their Seva. So I was very small and young, but I one day stepped up and I said, I want to do the seva. And the man who was doing the fanning, he said, get away, you're too small for this. The great master sitting in the chair and uh, he's saying, get away, you are too small for the seva. Great master said, give him the fan. 
I can't forget these things. And he had to give the fan. I got up on the stage and the fan was as big as I was, I think. <laughs> and I fanned him. That was Seva. What I'm doing today is no different. Seva is Seva, it doesn't matter what. Do not think there's a better Seva or worse Seva. Seva is an opportunity, which is great. What happens if we do Seva? What happens if we truly doing Seva without expectation? It is hitting our own ego. Our ego wants returns for everything. Ego invests to get a return in everything, in every action. And Seva is no return and therefore it's an offering. They used to say there are three kinds of Seva. Seva with wealth. People give a donation. We give donation to church, to temple. We give donations for in, even these functions. Sometimes you give donations for the arrangements, cost of arrangements made. Seva with wealth is the easiest Seva. Write a check and you are done. Give a little cash and you are done. It's a simpler Seva. The next higher Seva is Seva with the body. You carry something, you cook something, you do is a better Seva. The best Seva is Seva with the mind. What does Seva with the mind mean? That use the mind as an offering. Use meditation as an offering. Every day we meditate to get something. One day say, I am meditating as an offering to the Master. That's the best Seva. If you meditate as an offering, that meditation will be more successful than the meditation you say, I want to get some results and see what happens. So there can be Seva in everything. So you can do Seva of all three kinds and it has great value. The Seva levels ourselves. <clears throat> I remember there was a colonel here and he wanted to be uh, a disciple of the master. So he would, he would take some flights. He was an Air Force colonel in the United States. And he would take flights and wanted to go to a place called Bias, B-E-A-S, Bias. When he used to fly over the map, he would look at the map, he used to pronounce it bees and miss it. He told me the story himself that I missed it. I missed the data where I wanted to go many times because I thought bees and I want to go to Bias. The spelling was the same, of course. One day he landed up there and he saw a lot of people working, doing what is called Mitti Seva, carrying dirt, carrying mud on their heads for some building or some work that was going on in the Dera. And he saw so many people covered with dirt. So he had a suitcase with him and he called one of the guys. Hey, come here. Do you speak English? Yes, I do, sir. Can you carry my suitcase? <coughs> I have a reservation in the guest house. Yes, sir. I will carry. So the man carried his suitcase and, and when he reached the guest house, he took out a dollar bill and he said, this is American dollar. It's worth a lot more than your Indian rupee. I give you as a tip. He said, no, sir, I don't take tips. No, no, it's very good. You can spend it. It's, it's a good tip, one dollar. In these old days, dollar was worth more than nowadays. And the man said, no, sir, I don't take tips. I don't need tips. I'm okay. And he went away. In the evening, there was a meeting with the master. And only people who had come from overseas were sitting around the master. And he saw a man in a suit and all that looks the same like the man who carried his suitcase. So he said, who is that guy sitting in, a suit, uh, in that suit there? This is very similar, I've seen him. They said, yes, he's the chairman of these big companies. He's a multi-millionaire out here. And he's a follower of the master. He realized that he had called a multi-millionaire and offered him one dollar. <laughs> the man had millions of dollars. <laughs> so, but in the Seva, he could not recognize anybody. They were all leveled out. Seva is a great leveler. When you leveled, what is hit is your ego, nothing else. 
is a reduction of your ego as you do seva like that. So that is why when we used to have opportunities of doing seva, no matter what kind of seva it was, it was a big, great opportunity and we always welcomed it. All I am doing now is doing seva for my master. Sharing these experiences with you is just seva for my master. If it helps you, I'll be very happy. If it doesn't, look for something better. Fully free. If people say, do you initiate? I say, no. I can't. I have nobody to initiate. I have nobody. I don't. Do I look like a master? Do I work like a master? Do I work, have anything common? No. No turban. No beard. No look at all. I am not a master. I am just a disciple of a perfect living master. Which is a big thing to be disciple of a perfect living master and see in the love of the master. So that is why it's just merely a seva. I'm very happy to do this seva for my master, which incidentally makes me come and make friends with you and become uh, one who can share experiences so that it gives you some encouragement that what can be expected if you follow Surat Shabd Yoga. Very happy that I spent time with you. And we will have, uh, I understand that there is Prashad coming up in the afternoon. Uh, would you like to come one by one, take it here or just send it with some sevadars to you? <laughs> one by one. Okay, then we, I'll come back at three o'clock for Prashad and I'll be very happy to give it to you with my own hand individually. It will also give me a chance to see you more closely. Uh, and uh, then that will be the end of the program today. I'm very happy you could come and join me for these two days. And those who come from outside, please have a safe, uh, good journeys back. And those who come from Montreal, go back to home and meditate. <laughs> and uh, if some, of, some of you are coming to t Toronto also. If you come to Toronto, tell me if you meditated or not and what happened, okay? Thank you very much.